But that's such a cool pin. Oh, the see the shoes? Like Look at that. <gasps> oh, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I wore, by the way, I wore, I, I wore my... Um, Jaws socks to the Oscars this year. Yeah, Lee Unkridge took a picture of your socks and posted it on Twitter. They I'm like, did, really? yes. Oh, good. It was yeah, like, you want to that? yeah, cool. Uh, Kevin McCarthy, uh, Washington, D.C. So, Mr. Spielberg, I spoke with you at uh, BFG and also uh, Tintin about right. mocap. And right. mocap has obviously advanced a lot since you've yes, it, done yes, that. It has a lot. Can you talk about how it advanced for this particular film? But also, I want to geek out with you about that VR headset you wore that you were able to digitally direct environments. Can you talk about that? Well, all of us, all of us had, uh, had available to us because remember when you're, Doing a movie like this, the actors, when they're playing their avatars, are in a very, very large, white, empty volume, and there's no reference to the environment. There's no sense of scale or even what the set is. So we all had the set built into our VR glasses. So everybody, Ty and, 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 and Lena and Olivia and, and TJ and, and, and you know, Ben Mendelsohn, everybody that was an avatar, Wynn and Philip, who played, you know, show and Dato, they, they had to put the headset on, and suddenly that white, empty space was instantly an environment. The distracted globe, H's garage, it could be any number of environments. And then the actors, the cast, knew and could immediately relate to and feel the experience the audience was eventually going to feel when we digitally composited all of these elements and l layers to make the oasis come true. Wow, but you could walk through the environment yourself too. I got a lot. Right? Well, I could plan my shots in the environment. Yes. I could put the goggles on and walk <laughs> through the environment and figure out where to put my camera. And so, can you talk about like the performance capture element for both of you? What you what you were seeing? Obviously, Mr. Spielberg was just explaining sure. that. But like, there's a, such a cool shot in the trailer where they actually come around to your face as you're putting on the goggles for the first time. Yes. Can you just talk about what that was like for you as an actor? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the motion capture aspect of it all was such a crash course for all of us. We, no one had ever shot in motion capture, at least of the high five. And uh, so that was something that we, you know, over the first eight weeks, we shot all the motion capture stuff, everything that happens inside of the Oasis then. And so we were all learning together. Um, but it was super important, you know, that tool that we had to be able to hop into the environment and not only see the environment, but to see everyone who was synced to their avatar in inside of the volume. So I could look over and see Olivia's avatar and see what she looked mm -hmm. like. And H was a better example because H is, Eight feet tall, oh, yeah. um, and so it's it's good to see like okay like that's where that's where H is that's how tall H is all right now I'm gonna take this off and <laughs> and perform. Let's fly that. <laughs> that's so cool. One of the things I love about this movie is the idea of taking a leap, yes. uh, and it's yes. such a beautiful concept to yes. me. And I was like blown away by that. I was curious for each of you as artists, what was the biggest and hardest leap you ever had to take professionally as an artist, as a director, as an actor? Do you have a was there a moment where you just as a leap just going into a character or going into a film of yours? Um, I think it was just leaving home at 18 and moving to a, um, moving 3,000 miles away in order mm. to pursue this career and taking that leap of faith, faith mm. and hoping that it just works out, but not being able to predict the future. Yeah, that is a big leap. Yeah, yeah. Big No, leap. I think it's important to... What's your to, big leap? Well, I th every, every <laughs> leap. I think it's always important mm. to take on things that are constantly challenging you and are mm -hmm. constantly allowing mm -hmm. you to grow and learn. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think every decision for me and my work and even outside of my work, I, I wanna make sure that I'm expanding my skill set and, and mm -hmm. meeting people that, that you know, can encourage me to grow even further and better mm -hmm. myself. Was one of your films the biggest leap for you? One of my movies was the biggest leap. I think they, you know, the biggest leap is hard because all the films, you know, our leaps, everything, I think that's what Ty was saying, everything that we commit to is, is, is a leap of faith. Um, probably the biggest leap for me was sneaking onto the Universal lot when I was <laughs> 16, 17 years old illegally and spending yeah. a summer there and breaking the law every day technically. I guess that was probably the biggest leap. I've been following your career all my life, and I, your name is synonymous with John Williams. I mean, I, I, mm -hmm. every movie you've made except for Color Purple, which was Quincy Jones, Thomas Newman did Bridges Spies, now you have Alan Silvestri, one of the greatest composers right. in the history of right. movies, scoring this film. But you probably have a second hand with Williams by this point, because you guys worked together for so long. Can you yes. talk about the differences and the similarities of working with Alan Silvestri and then also working with Williams? And what did Silve what, what, How different was it with Silvestri? Well, I picked Alan Silvestri because I knew, I've known Alan. I gave Alan the first movie he ever scored with a full orchestra, which was Fandango for Kevin Reynolds. That was the first time he ever actually scored a film with an orchestra. Before that, he worked with Bob Zemeckis and he just had a guitar and it mm -hmm. wasn't an orchestra. And um, and so I go way, way back with Alan, but there's very few composers today that understand uh, this 
thematic importance of creating a, 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 a musical narrative. Johnny does it in his sleep. He's just brilliant at it. A lot of you know, Johnny's forefathers and collaborators back in the 60s and 50s, you know, they all understood giving different characters their own themes, giving the bad guy a bad guy theme, giving the heroes good, good heroic themes. But that's become less and less done in movies today. And today, their musics are more atmospheric. Hmm. They're like acoustical mm. sounds or yeah. almost musical effects. Um, this Alan Silvestri score for Ready Player One is in the tr tradition, the best tradition, of the great old Hollywood movies where everybody has their own theme. And that was in the tradition of Johnny Williams and Alan Silvestri does that naturally himself and he brought that art to our movie as well. Can you talk about uh, getting the rights to all these uh, particular elements? You know, it was crazy and it wasn't, it wasn't my job to get the rights, thank goodness. We had a wish list of rights. And Christie's of amazing. IPs and Christy McCosco, the producer along with the Warner Brothers people, they all got together to try to, f to, to fill these requests. We went to Disney and Disney was just as cooperative as other companies were, Universal and Paramount and, and Fox, giving us the rights to some of their alien characters. Uh, but Disney gave us rights and we were able to use, uh, I don't want to give them all away, but if you look mm -hmm. really carefully, you'll see little versions. We didn't want to, the thing that I was trying to express before, and I think it got misinterpreted, we didn't want to use the big iconic Star Wars characters of Luke Skywalker and, and Han Solo and, and Leia and Vader. We didn't want to, to, because that's a contemporary series of films that is alive and even more alive today and is going forward into the, uh, f uh, forever mm -hmm. into the future. But we wanted a lot of the smaller characters and some of the ships, the X-Wings, and Disney was very cooperative in giving us permission. Well, thank you for this movie. I was crying nerd tears the entire time. Oh, this is one of the oh, greatest great, experiences great. of my life to be Fantastic. across with you guys. Wow. Terminator. Talk about your performance ca motion capture. Were you on stilts to make you look taller? Well, no. I was myself. And what, what they did was they put a, a, we all had helmets, but they put like a really like tall, like pink ball. So that way oh. Ty, Olivia, and, and obviously Wynn and Philip would look up at it when it was when I'm eight, so that way they can make an eye contact with me. Uh, they would often forget to do that because they're looking at me, and I'm like, God, I'm not that tall. Uh, so, so it was really cool. And um, and the great thing is I had acting coaches on, on the set to make sure that my body language felt different than I you do. You had to be bigger. You had to be yeah. bigger. I had to have a little bit more swag. I had to be mindful of the fact that my torso was mechanical. So they were really mm. helpful in terms of just making sure when I walked, I walked a certain way. When I ran, I ran differently. Um, and it was just really helpful. And also just in terms of the the the, the demeanor was a little different um, because I, I'm literally embodying my alter ego. So I got to be a little bit more confident, a little bit more swaggy. But then when I become the Iron Giant, my body language has to be a little different because I, I'm not as swaggy. I'm, I'm sort of a gentle giant. And so I'm a little bit more timid and my movements are a little bit slower. And Wait, you still mocap the Iron Giant? I mocap the Iron Giant. Oh my God, I didn't realize that. Yeah, everything you see is like is, is me. <laughs> like I'm doing all those things. I'm and, nerding out. This uh, is insane. It's like crazy. And so and again, the acting coach is really helpful because Sometimes I would move too fast or do something, and they're like, you gotta remember, like, you're really tall, you're really big, you're a robot. So you gotta be slower, your, your moves have to be a little bit more mechanical. So they were really great about making sure my Iron Giant felt different than my age. And obviously, in the real world, when I'm Helen, I'm a little bit more, you know, just sort of normal. So, so cool. it was, I really, it took a lot of help from Steven and, and the acting coach just to make sure we got it right and so that way it felt really um, honest. And I know the voice, obviously, they do, they, yeah. they, they could do that with they After Effects, that. but mm -hmm. do you speak deeper on, like, no, for those I spoke scenes? normally on, okay. on, on the set. And then when I went to ADR, uh, Steven was very particular about how I should sound and, huh. and the levels and things like that. So we spent many hours tweaking the voice and we were really happy with it. It's so cool yeah, how they I know, do it's, it. It's my cadence as well and all that kind of stuff. So it's really fun to watch. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. One of the things that blew my mind, I was reading about this and Spielberg was just talking about this, mm -hmm. was he had VR goggles that he could actually go into the set digitally yeah, it's crazy. and look around. And Sometimes I, he let us see them. That's what I was saying. Like, what did you, so because that helped you on the mocap stuff, right? It did, to, and they did. They had like some like wooden furniture around so we wouldn't walk through a couch or like you know, <laughs> bump into a door. Um, so just so that we, we had a sense of it. But sometimes he let us look at it just so we get a sense of how far someone was from us or, or just what was all around us, especially like my garage. Like, all of that was mocap. Yeah. So, we're just walking around a, a, a white empty space like, talking <laughs> to each other. Um, but Steven could see how it would all look in, in the end. Yeah, Kevin McCarthy, yes. uh, Washington, D.C. Oh, first of all, Greg. Oh, I come from D.C. Are you really? Yeah, I'm from Maryland. I well, live in Maryland right now. My wife and I live in Silver Spring. Really? really? That's like 20 minutes away. Dude, where do you live in Maryland? I live in Rockville. 
Why aren't we hanging out more often? I don't know. This has yeah. gotta happen. Dude, so. we gotta play video games yeah. together. Yeah, I live in Japan. Too. Yeah. All right, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> You're super close. That's perfect. Super yeah, close. Yeah. 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 Come to Japan. Just casual, like a three. Yeah, that's right. Not a big deal. My wife and I are actually planning on going to Japan. I took, I took Japanese in high school. I don't oh, remember, really? I don't remember oh. any of it though. Konnichiwa. I know Konnichiwa and Watashi wa Makashi san. That's all oh, I have. Oh, God. Thank you so much. You call me Japanese, but I don't trust you. No, no, no. I'm not saying it. Well, congratulations to you both. Thank you so much. Huge fan of Spielberg, obviously. I want to know what your performance capture experience was like. Mm -hmm. um, because to me, like he's done so much motion capture uh, with BFG and, uh, and mm -hmm. Tintin. Yeah. What was it like for you guys on set? And I was reading that he actually had VR goggles that he could go in and digitally direct yes. scenes. So yes. talk about yes. what that experience was like for you guys. Yes, he had it, right. Yeah, and yeah. since he didn't have a mocap suit on, mm -hmm. it was a huge advantage because he was technically invisible mm -hmm. <laughs> to the rest of the entire cast. Mm -hmm. And so there was people everywhere on the set and we always try not to run into them. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And he had a little monitor, like a monitor. Yeah, and he had like yeah. a controller. Controller, like a control, like a controller camera, like, you know. He was playing How video do I put games it in English? all like, day. Yeah. That's it was crazy. amazing. Yeah, it was crazy. What was the mocap experience like for you guys? Because you guys were like in a, it was in a, in a, like a volume? How yeah, did... volume, like oh. a day or a, like a only white floor and then a lot of cameras above our head. And um, no AC, no AC, <laughs> and, uh, and then no, lights, yeah. and then a lot of dots on our faces. Yeah, we had like this contagious yeah. disease. On and us. Uh, wow, yeah, that's we wear like a mocap suit and a lot of balls on our body, and uh, that you know like uh, so we have to imagine like uh, there were only like balls and dots, you know. Wow. And Adam so, helped us all. Out yeah, a lot. he's like the first assist assistant director, mm -hmm. and he would always be like, "Tape, don't step on the tape. Yes. You're gonna go through a goddamn closet." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, don't That's go amazing. through that wind. <laughs> I want that footage. So yes. Spielberg needs to put that at the end of the movie as like a blooper reel or something like that. You guys in your mocap. Yeah. Um, I love the fact that your character consistently saying. Don't you know? He's 11 years old. Stop looking at me like an 11 year old. I oh, was like, yeah. that was cool. I, I'm wondering, like, because you're a kid. Like, do you do you feel that same way in real life? Like, because you're obviously you're you're awesome. You're smart. You're funny. Do you feel like people look differently at you if you're if you're a younger kid? Well, I think people judge a lot online if you're typically younger. Oh. And um, me in the movie, since I'm the younger kid, I don't mm -hmm. like being judged by my age. So I like kind of talk back and I have this <laughs> sass and attitude for them. <laughs> Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, he's really cool. Can you tell me the first time you heard Spielberg yell action? Do you remember the first moment? Oh, I know uh, this one. What? So uh, the first scene I filmed, you probably saw in the movie, it's me getting out of my car and my arm's on fire. Oh, so yeah, I was amazing. doing this and Steve was like, action! And I, we had this fake DeLorean inside. So mm -hmm. I opened the door, slammed the door shut, the door fell off, but mm -hmm. no one could. Yeah. And I, I walked and that was my first scene, it was magical. Yeah, my first one was a uh, bow in front of the anorak on their oh. first key. To yeah. Oh. Hey, that was mine as well. No, I, I was I was bow like a samurai style. Oh, yeah. that's so cool, and man. And then I th that was my first thing, and uh, I said to Steven like a uh, uh, I present presented presented to Steven like a how to bow. Oh, uh, we bow. In Japan, like this, so he said, "Like, oh, go ahead, do it," and he used it. <laughs> so that's in the movie because you told him yes. how you did it. Yes. Yeah, he takes everyone's ideas. Dude, I'm gonna go. I'm seeing. I'm seeing the movie again tonight. I'm gonna look for that. Yes, yes. What, what, like what is it? What? Can it's you it's teach a front me? of the. Oh uh, yeah, it's 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 it's. Can I move? Yeah. Like, <laughs> here, yeah. Okay. Here's the sword. Okay. Okay. And uh, you should put out the sword like this, and then, like, step back one step, and then like a we call Caesar. Yeah. And then. Just put from front of your uh, put put the sword from you and then bow like this, right and left. Dude, yes. that's awesome. Yeah, that's yes. what I do you on Chinese do, New Year do. whenever I want to get the red packet. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, guys, they're wrapping me up. It's an absolute honor. Thank you for teaching me that. Thank you so much. And we gotta hang out, dude. Yeah, we gotta hang out. Yeah, come I'll, to Japan, where? please. I'll come yeah, to Japan. Yeah. 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 You know, I'm sure you're aware of how awesome, like, because the, the roles you've been choosing recently, Rogue, Rogue One, this, I mean, you're like nerd heaven, like the roles you've been doing. I'm curious, like, it, has it Thank got, you. have you, has it felt different now that you've, like, kind of, like, done these, like, like awesome, like a Star Wars movie, you've done Ready Player One, are you noticing different types of fans that are finding your work? Uh, yes and no. I mean, I, I am not in, you know, like, in, in touch of a wider sort of social media sense or not. I'm pretty quiet, but, 
Uh, but, you know, you I encounter people, you know, on the street and whatnot. But here's the thing. No one ever expects to see sort of someone from Star Wars walking <laughs> down the street. <laughs> So, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's not like some huge deal. Like, everywhere I go, they're like, oh my God, he built the test tower. You, know, you don't it, get that when, when people see you? I, n- I'd yell that at you if I saw you walking down the street. I'm like, no, Death Star! You know what? You wouldn't. I if wouldn't. If you actually saw me walking down the street, you wouldn't say a thing. Oh, God. I'm like really freaked out yeah, right now. That's you, what did I'm you just go into now. character? <laughs> you <would've>... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, sorry. No, no. I'm all right. Are you rattled? I'm sorry. a little rattled now. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, what was the first time Spielberg yelled action for you in a scene? Um, that just gives me chills. Sorry. I, I remember that. Because it's just asked the question. The first moment. Um, when I came in, I will never forget that day. Um, and I sat down and and I could hear, I got one note just before we were about to start and then that action, it was like, and we're, and we're here and we're doing this, let's do this. And taking the leap, <laughs> that's what it was. Wow, and mm-hmm. for you, what was your first, do you remember the first moment Spielberg yelled action for you in a scene? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I do, and it was in the it was in the volume, so it was in the space that you uh, love, um, and uh, it's just kind of awesome. I think I messed it up the first time he said it. it was kind of like, oh, can I do that again? Oh, what? Uh, <laughs> okay, now leap. That's mm-hmm. amazing. Yeah, I remember just thinking as well. I think the first take when when Stephen Spielberg said action as well. I think I, I was kind of going like, don't get it wrong, don't get it wrong, don't. Don't get this wrong. Don't get this wrong. <laughs> I think I was going, and then I, I think I kind of chilled out. I think as the day went on. But. You know, it's got to be surreal, obviously, having him behind the camera directing you. He's obviously a very hands-on filmmaker. Um, I'm curious, when you get cast for a role like this, do you brush up on older Spielberg movies? Like, do you make sure you've seen like everything? Like, do you, do you talk to him about Raiders? Do you talk to him about Jaws? Do you talk to him about ET? Do you have... I didn't do any homework because I'd seen all these films. <laughs> yeah, I, like, I, I didn't have to do anything. I've I've seen them. I've grown up with these films. What's your I've, favorite? I love Jaws. I love yeah. E.T. Um, it's hard to say what the favorite is because um, there's such a huge range, you know, yeah. in in the Steven Spielberg palette. It's, it's, it's endless. It's is there incredible. anything crazier than watching the T-Rex chase a DeLorean? I, 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 I feel like it's all I ever needed in my life was that moment of a T-Rex chasing a DeLorean. I mean, like, this movie is full of everything I've ever wanted in my life. What was your first experience watching it? Where, where did you, when did you guys first see it? I was on my own in Toronto um, in a theater, um, which was amazing. Um, but also, it would have been nice to have, see everyone else's reaction and have other people there. But I was on my own, and when the credits went up, I just went, "Yes!" <laughs> and I was like, "Oh yeah, no one's, no one's around apart from, apart from the bar. on the Warner Brothers lot, which is kind of an awesome place to see it." Too. Who were you with? Uh, a bunch of a bunch of the cast and a bunch of uh, you know the the filmmakers and stuff and and you know studio people from Warner's, but the South by Southwest screening oh. was off the chart. Were you there for that? I wasn't, unfortunately, but I saw my internet blew up when yeah. it. All that must have been crazy. That. It was like the. To let the doggies loose and woof off they went. <laughs> it was awesome. And I'm sure this is a cl- cliche question to ask an author, but when you're writing a book, I don't think you could ever imagine this happening with the book. But is it something you thought about at all, like what a movie version of this would look like while you were writing it? Because to me, when I read it, I was like, how could anybody ever turn this into a movie? It'd be impossible. But that was my thought too. You know, right from the get go, uh, uh, and I came to. Uh, uh, fiction writing uh, from starting out as a screenwriter. And I had had such a dispiriting, you know, uh, experience with my first movie getting made and, and watched, you know, kind of lost control of my story and the characters and uh, and was powerless to do anything about it and had always wanted to be a screenwriter up to that point. And then once I actually saw what the job was and saw, you know, how hard it was, uh, it made me rethink that and make me wonder, maybe I want to write fiction, you know, so I have more control over my story and my characters and I can just geek out uh, directly with my audience to the reader and drill down as deep into geek culture as I want to and not worry about it ever getting made as a movie. And then also the, you know, the idea that I had conceived of mashing up all of pop culture inside the Oasis. I knew, you know, if I want to, um, you know, my idea was to write a story and use that pop culture shorthand that you use when you're talking to your friends and the way that you weave yeah. references and stuff, uh, you know, when you're geeking out with your friends. And I wanted to try to tell a story with that voice, but I knew that that would probably prohibit the chances of it ever 
uh, being a movie just because I knew enough about licensing. Like uh, my first movie, Fanboys, like getting it, that was would have been impossible to make too if Lucasfilm hadn't given us permission to use Star Wars. And this was like that times you know a thousand. So I, I just I assumed it could never be a movie, and then also. Um, so did I, by yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah. Even when I first read it, I thought... <laughs> How is it possible? Uh, right, I just yeah. thought, this yeah. is cool, but uh, the scale of this is impossible <laughs> yeah. to do. Um, yeah, uh, so. so I thought it would have to be... Uh, uh, but I, I, it would either have to be drastically scaled back, or uh, it might get into a, made a movie that would barely resemble uh, the the story, and... You know, um, uh, and that was part of the you know uh, reason it was more difficult when we did start to adapt it was because I had written it, you know, uh, I had written it in such a way that it was intended to just be a novel, and uh, I did things that would only work in a novel, you know, and the first person narrative especially kind of uh, limits uh, your storytelling ability as to what happens with the other characters. So Wade kind of ended up doing uh, uh, doing everything, and also everything's told from his perspective, and also. Uh, he does a lot of a lot of the challenges are not cinematic at all. You mm. know, they're playing classic video games, Pac Man, re- yeah, reenacting yeah. an old D and D module, stuff that works great and is fun in the book, and you know, lights up your imagination. But in a movie, would just stop the stop the story dead. You know, and mm. especially this story and the way that you know Stephen had structured it, uh, you know, is like a roller coaster. You know, once you have that first setup uh, and, uh, and and establish the contest, then it just never. Right, yeah, I mean, yeah. we had the scene where the guy plays Pac-Man for four hours and, <laughs> and really cut. Ty shot and, it too, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. He yeah. did. I mean, we, he trained for six months. Um, and it just didn't work. Yeah. It just was like, wh- what? First, first test screening. People and like, everybody's oh. dying because he's taking so long. Yeah. 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 So, so. so we knew, I knew that there were going to have to be drastic changes. And, you know, and like I've said in other uh, interviews, like once Steven Silver came on board, he has such an amazing track record with book to film adaptations, yeah. even science fiction you know, uh, really complex stuff like Jurassic Park. He manages to distill that down, you know, and all that exposition. There's a lot of exposition about DNA and everything else in Jurassic Park uh, that he manages to distill and make entertaining. And then uh, as soon as that is set up, then you're on a roller coaster ride. And that's, you know, I feel like he pulls that same amazing magic trick with Ready Player One and sets up the oasis and the dystopian future and the virtual world and everything. And then it's just, then it's yeah. on, you know? When I was reading the book, uh, I read it in three days. I'll never forget it. Uh, it was a couple years ago. Right when I was right after Spielberg had just signed on to the project. And I was just, I was like, I was blown away by what the references were. I'm curious what the choice was to remove the Spielberg references. I, I think it's, it was a smart move. He basically I agree. felt like this was to refer to himself was going to take you out of the story and that is not what interests him at all. I mean, he wants you to be caught up in this story. You know, it's not, he's not Lars von Trier, you know. Um, yeah. He's not trying to create some sort of Brechtian experience where you're, um, I don't think. Uh, well, he doesn't have an ego. He doesn't need to, he doesn't have anything else right. to prove and totally. he doesn't need to, you know, yeah. everybody, the whole world has celebrated him for decades. So he doesn't need to celebrate himself at all and which is how he viewed referencing his own Stuff so that was why it fell to me and Zach and Adam Stockhausen and other people to you know say well we're going to pay tribute to the decade of the 1980s and even the late 70s and 1980s we can't do that without you know uh, touching upon some stuff that you had a hand in uh, uh, and usually he would say yes if it was something he had just produced somebody else's film that he right. had just uh, uh, been behind. Well, the, the DeLorean right off the yeah. bat he was like it's still him yeah yeah, yeah. well yeah. but Zemeckis, like even in the first yeah. meeting he was like I'm going to have to call Bob. You know, yeah. So, because that has to be in the movie, but um, but yeah, that was you know, it, it really once you get past that though, Stephen is all about story, you know. So one of the things that's refreshing is, and it's good as a writer to have somebody who's guiding you, who's saying, no, we're not doing this, we're not doing that, we have to go down this way. So that's what determines what references are going to be made and what aren't, you know, mm-hmm. because if uh, you know, if they're related to story, someone playing Joust. I like Joust. Joust was a big part of my childhood. I wouldn't mind watching someone play a real-life version of Joust, but it's not tied in to the story in the same way adventure is, for example. You mm. know, so so that kind of tells you: Are we going to do someone playing real-life Joust? Maybe, maybe not. Are we going to? Can we afford to get rid of adventure? Probably not. You know, we have to find a way to work it in there. Mm. I don't. Yeah. I don't want to give away too much. But. but and that's what I love. Like even the references that were maybe a big set piece in the book uh, are are. Most of them are all still there. Maybe if it's just like a poster on the background or like uh, 
like the, we had a big tribute to Rush 2112 in the book. Yes. Uh, and now, you know, there's you a poster see, in the movie. It's a poster, yeah. Rush 2112. And a t-shirt. And t-shirt yeah. when you first meet. A, uh, it's in Holiday's room. With, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And also when you first uh, uh, meet Lena's character, uh, H, in the real world, she is wearing the same exact t-shirt that her character is wearing in the book when you first meet her. And yeah. that was something that was never mentioned in the script, but somehow made it from the book into the movie because even the costume department. Well, you know, right. They would, they would all. There'd be lots of times where, you know, um, in the production, when Ernie wasn't there, where people were taking stuff from the book. In fact, I often, because Stephen's very secretive about the script, there would be times where I'd be like, oh, no, 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 that character is gone now um, and has a different name, or that's not who IROC is. Any, In fact, I, I think there was one point where someone wanted to bring IROC as he existed into the book as a character, name oh, some yeah, character yeah. that. I was like, no, no, we already, oh, we already <laughs> used IROC for another <laughs> one. Yeah. So, so there was definitely, but there's a lot of people going back to, you know, not only to the book, but to Ernie himself as inspiration for elements in the movie. And, and well, sorry, gentlemen, sure. we gotta, yeah, we gotta move on. Sure. Gotta, okay, can I say one last thing? Yeah, please. One last so, thing, about, the one thing, yeah. last thing, I, you know, I, and I kind of just realized it during this interview about uh, uh, a really great reason for Stephen not to want to reference his other movies is this is a brand new Steven Spielberg movie, you know, that uh, yeah. uh, your people are going to be referencing from here on out, you know, once they see it. Like, why stop this new, brand new Steven Spielberg movie to reference Steven Spielberg movies from the past? Like, may, I think maybe that's just one step to too meta. Too and, meta. Yeah. yeah. And so